children, Joseph and Elise, and I was like, yeah, I picked that up yesterday. It's a new thing on Zoom, isn't it? Um, somebody's moved my prop. It was a tin of um, plastic tin with bungees in it. That's fine. That's okay. Because now, Jesus wanted to show how much stronger than the devil he was. Okay. Joseph and Lee's. That's great. That's what I want. Okay. And now, Josh, you can have a bit closer because I'm, I'm going to run out of the thing. So Jesus said the devil is a bit like a strong man. And here's, here's a strong man. Can you see a strong man here? Can you see a strong man? And he's got lots of things like my phone sitting on the floor there. And while he's there and he's looking very, very strong, I can't take the phone off him because he's so strong, okay? But Jesus wanted to say how powerful he is that he could come and he could tie up the strong man, okay? It's okay, it's not killing you. It's all right, okay. Should we do another one just for effects? Okay. Jesus said he's so strong that he can tie up the devil. He can tie up the strong man. Is that okay? Is that hurting? Is that right? Is that okay? Okay. And then when I've done that, I can take his stuff. Now, of course, Jesus wasn't talking about phones. Jesus was talking about people. And we can see in the Gospels the way that Jesus could bind up Satan and drive out the demons a drive out evil out of people's lives. And he can change people's lives and make them so much better when they come to follow him. And many of us here who have become Christians know how wonderful that is, that Jesus has bound up the strong man. He's taken the evil out of our lives so that we can follow him and have a life with God for eternity. And that's what we're going to be thinking about today. Do you want me to untie you now? Okay. Thank you, Josh. Right. Um, have we got off cord on that? Great. Okay. Um, let's go back. Uh, thanks a lot, Tarek, for doing the reading. Let's come back to Luke chapter. Luke chapter 11 on page 1043. Luke chapter 11 on page 1043. The thing I'm reading this morning includes one of the most extraordinary things that anyone said about Jesus. So Jesus drives out this demon. And in verse 15, some of the people say, by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. What they're saying is that Jesus, as he drives out the demon, is actually on the side of the devil. He's in league with the devil. He is doing evil. That's an extraordinarily remarkable thing to say. And yet I think that an argument a bit like that resurfaces in different forms today. Um, so the likes of Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, or uh, Christopher Hitchens, both seem to want to get rid of a God and Christianity, they see it as a poison in our society that needs to be got rid of. So what do we make of such a challenge? I think it'll be increasingly thrown at us if we're Christians, that people can increasingly say, I think people don't quite say, look, Jesus is evil, but they'll say, you know, his religion is evil and his followers are evil. The people are influenced by his teaching are evil. But what are we going to make of that challenge? The implications we really need to get rid of Jesus. You get rid of Jesus out of our curriculum. Get rid of Jesus out of our lives. And our society will be so much better. And if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian here this morning and you're investigating Jesus and the Christian faith, you may well have heard that accusation. Well, I wonder what you think of it. I wonder what you've heard Christians say in response. Well, I'm glad today that today we don't have to worry what Christians say, because in our readings there we have Jesus' own response to that. Jesus being accused of being in league with the devil. Well, what does he say about it? And it's not just an intellectual battle. It's not just a sort of 
oh, this is an interesting debate. I wonder what the Christians are going to say. I wonder what Jesus is going to say. Jesus says it actually has massive implications for the whole direction and the whole purpose of our lives. So Jesus begins by saying a divided kingdom falls. This is verses 17 and 18. If you've got the handout, my first point on the handout, a divided kingdom falls. Let me read verses 17 and 18. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a household divided against itself will fall. But what does he mean by that? Well, if you've read through the first 10 chapters of Luke's gospel, we have you know, there recorded that Jesus heals people. He drives out demons. He transforms people's lives for good. And it's not only him that's doing it. Back in chapter 10 and verse 17, remember, he sent out the, the uh, 72 disciples. And we read this in chapter 10 and verse 17. The 72 disciples returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Here we see a wholesale attack going on on the devil and evil. So in our past day, Jesus drives out a demon that's robbing a man of speech. And now he can speak again. Uh, uh, people still love to be talking about the sort of the vaccine rollout. It's lovely to see all this vaccine rolling out so that people are being protected against the pandemic. But in the gospel, we see an even more significant rollout, the rollout of good, the rollout of God's kingdom in the Jesus Christ, Jesus' story. It's a wonderful story about lives being transformed for good by the Lord Jesus Christ. But what do Jesus' opponents make of it? Well, they can't deny Jesus' power. That's really significant. They can't deny Jesus' power. He has amazing, all-conquering, supernatural power. Nobody can deny that. Even Jesus' opponents have to acknowledge that he is powerful, that he has great supernatural power. They have to acknowledge his authority. But what they do is they deny its source. Yes, they say, sure, he's driving out demons. But it's not by God, it's by Satan. It's by evil that this is happening. But Jesus' response is, hang on, that is just not logical. That just doesn't make sense. How can that work? Why on earth would Satan empower another individual to attack him in such a massive and wholesale way? It's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to ruin. As Jesus says, it's true of any kingdom. Verse 70, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a household divided against itself will fall. Why would Satan empower somebody else to fight against him in such a massive and such a wholesale way? We can see in politics, a political party that is fight, has infighting will lose an election. Sports teams that aren't working together will lose. First kids question, what happens when a kingdom fights against itself? What happens when a kingdom fights against itself? So what Jesus is saying is that a life, his life is aimed at the wholesale destruction of evil, the wholesale destruction of the devil. So we read of healings and exorcisms. It's clear that is what is happening. Why would the devil think that is a good idea? It just doesn't make sense. But what about those who today say that Jesus and Christianity are evil? How does what Jesus says here help us to answer that accusation? Well, I guess the question we have to ask is, has Jesus and his teaching been a force for evil over the past 2,000 years? Has Christianity been a force for evil in our history? Now, of course, sadly, there have been terrible moments in church history, the Crusades, I think some of the child abuse scandals and the cover-ups over the last 50 years have indeed been terrible. But there have been massive positives that we just take for granted today. So as I do some research this week, uh, we say the Nicene Creed. It's the creed that says God from God, light from light, very God from very God. It's this creed that they wrote in uh, 325 AD to remind us that Jesus really is God. But something else came out of the creed, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Basically, the council instructed Christians in every city where there was a cathedral that they also had to build a hospital. 
And that's where hospitals came from. The whole idea, I think, uh, you know, we have seen our hospitals working incredibly hard in the last year. Well, where did the idea of a hospital come from? Answer, it came from the Christians in the early centuries. How about orphanages caring for children whose parents have died? Again, that's been a Christian concern. The abolition of the slave trade, prison reform, protection of women, the poor, the marginalized. All these have come from Christianity. All these have ultimately come from Jesus and his followers. The things we take for granted today, the things that came from Jesus and his teaching. So to look at the life and teaching of Jesus, to look at the impact it's had on the world, just say, well, that's evil. That just seems perverse and totally against all the evidence. Jesus says, how can a house that is divided stand? It will fall. It will be utterly ruined. So I need one plane to keep my page down. Right. Okay, then my second point that Jesus wants to make is he challenges these people who are accusing him of evil. He says, well, what about your disciples? Are they evil? Are your disciples evil? Look at verse 19. Verse 19. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So they will be your judges. So it's clear that Jesus says that Jesus is not the only person who is performing exorcism. He's not the only person who is driving out demons. We saw a man back in chapter 9 driving out demons. And Jesus' question is, if you're calling me evil by driving out demons, what are you saying about the other people who are driving out demons? Some of your followers are driving out demons. Where are they getting their power from? You can't just sort of cherry pick. You can't say, well, our followers are doing it by God, but yours are doing it by the devil. Jesus says, think about it. Look at my life. Look at my teaching. I want to say, look at the influence he's had over his disciples. Can we really say that it's evil? Can we say it'd be better to get rid of the entire influence of Christianity, get rid of hospitals, orphanages, put slavery back in place? Would that really be better? So if it's not evil, and Jesus is rightly arguing it's, it's his, his teaching is not evil, his life is not evil, then where does it come from? Well, verse 20 to 22 on the argument goes, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. It's come upon you. Back in the time of the Exodus, Pharaoh had magicians who tried to replicate Moses's uh, miracles. But as the place got bigger and more powerful, the magicians ultimately began to acknowledge that they could not compete that the force behind Moses and his miracles was far too great for them. And so they use this phrase, the finger, this is the finger of God. They acknowledge that God, if you like, had put his hand into Egypt and it was God who was at work. And that's the same here. God has entered the world to defeat Pharaoh. And now God has entered the world to defeat the devil. Jesus says, as you see this massive power for good that I am unleashing, maybe the most the better conclusion, the right conclusion, is not that it comes from the devil, but to realize that God's finger, God's kingdom has come upon you. I think you just want to say, as we watch Jesus, as we read about Jesus, as we read about his power for good, as we read about his miracles, as we read about everything he's doing for good, then the right conclusion surely is, that he is coming from God himself. He is bringing God's kingdom. And if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian here this morning, you're just investigating the Christian faith, then read through a gospel. Who do you think Jesus is? Where do you think his power comes from? And if you are a Christian, I want to encourage us to read through Luke's account, just to be reminded of who Jesus is, of what he's come to do. That we can be sure about Jesus, that he is God's son, the one who brings in God's kingdom. Luke wants us to be certain. Luke wants us to be confident as we look at these accounts that that is what is going on. And maybe we can share that with others. Encourage others to read the gospel. Encourage others to say, who is Jesus? 
He's more than just a good man. He's more than just a teacher. Here is a man with God's power, bringing the finger of God into the world, bringing God's kingdom into the world. And he wants to respond, us to respond to that. Our next kid's question. When we see all the powerful good that Jesus did, who has come to us? Who has come to us? And what does that mean for evil? Well, let's pick it up in verses 21 and 22. When a strong man, we did this in the children's talk, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. He says, remember the devil, look, he's powerful, he's strong. His possessions are safe. Those who are possessed by demons, he can control. But, verse 22, but when somebody stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. So I say Jesus speaks of Satan. Here is a strong man, a powerful man, a man who has many people under his power. But now in Jesus, there's a far greater, a far more powerful dynamic at work. The Lord Jesus Christ. What can he do? Well, he can bind up Satan, just as I bind up Josh. He can tie up Satan. And that means that he can take the spoils. He can release people from the power of evil. And we've seen that powerfully just in our few sermons. Here there's a mute man, a man who's mute, can suddenly speak. A few weeks ago, we looked at that boy who kept the devil kept throwing him into the fire to destroy him. And Jesus could release him. Made most famous all that, that the man who called himself Legion because he said, There are many demons in me. He was terrorizing a whole neighborhood, shouting and screaming and cutting himself. And again, Jesus again was able to release him from his demon oppression. He was still able to set the man free. Jesus is the stronger man who overpowers Satan. Uh, next kid's question. What did Jesus do to Satan? What did Jesus do to Satan? And again, as we look down history, we can see the powerful redeeming force for good that Jesus has brought in thousands and millions of lives. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you know that in your own life. You've seen the lives of those around you, how God has transformed lives. Not perfectly, not completely, but God has transformed lives for good. And as we see that, let's come to the right conclusion. The finger of God has come among us. Evil is being destroyed. Jesus has brought the kingdom of God into our world. But again, Jesus doesn't want to leave it just as an interesting intellectual debate, an interesting philosophical argument. He, he says this has massive implications for those who are listening to him. And so he challenges people in verses 23 to 28 to side with him, to gather with him. Verse 23. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus challenges about which side are we on? Which side are we on? It's a very important question. He says if you're not on his side, if you're not actually trying to gather people in, then Jesus warns that we are against him. Jesus says, Philip was saying in the introduction, Jesus says there is no middle ground. There's no fence for us to sit on. You can't shrug your shoulders and say, well, I'm in the middle and Jesus is on one side and others are on the other. Jesus says there is no fence. If you've been listening to this argument, you're listening to Jesus. You're seeing his compelling good and the compelling logic of his arguments then Jesus says we can't turn around and say, I don't know, well, it doesn't matter. Well, I'm a bit of agnostic. I'm just on the fence. Jesus says, if you're not going to side with me and my goodness, if you're not going to side with God and his power and goodness, then you are siding with the devil against me. There's no fence. There's no middle ground. As we see Jesus' goodness, his God-given power for good, we must side with him. We must go his way. And so I have to ask each one of us, as we look at this evidence, as we read through a gospel, we see Jesus' amazing power and goodness, the way he's transforming lives, the way he's releasing people from evil. 
the question is, have we sided with Jesus? Have we put our trust in him? Have we made Jesus the Lord of our lives? Are we gathering with him? And in order to drive the point home, Jesus tells this chilling parable about what it means if you don't put your trust in Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 24. Jesus said this, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept, clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Jesus here is speaking about an individual, somebody who has come under the influence of Jesus' teaching, who's seen the goodness of it, but ultimately has decided not to side with Jesus, not to receive God's Holy Spirit into their lives. And Jesus warns that the results can be disastrous. That without Jesus and his spirit living in us, without Jesus' leadership, who knows what evil can come into somebody's lives. Sadly, you can see people turn away from Christ into all sorts of evil. But maybe the challenge is more to our society, the society in which Jesus lived then. Both had received so much good from Jesus. We've received so much good. We thought about it. Hospitals, the Christian moral code, compassion for the weak, respect for human life, equality of the sexes. So many good things our society has received from Christ. But what happens if they ultimately reject Jesus? If they ultimately don't side with him? What happens? Well, Jesus warns that it might well be disastrous. And we can see that. In our society, there are all sorts, sadly, all sorts of philosophies and lifestyles. They're often driven by selfishness and by greed. They lead to so many broken relationships. And the things that come from that, mental health problems, confusion, suicide. We receive so much good from Christ, but if we do not accept it, and we go after other philosophies, And sadly, all sorts of terrible things can happen. Jesus' warning is very, very stark. If you come under the influence of Christ, but you don't take Christ on as your Lord and Savior, then he says you could end up in a disastrous place. As our society rushes away from its Christian roots, where is it going to end up? And then finally, there's this encounter with this woman, verse 27. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. She thinks, what a wonderful person Jesus is. I really want what amazing it would be to be his mother. But Jesus again, blessed rather. We've heard this so many times in this series on Luke, who hear the word of God and obey it. It's not about being close to Jesus in terms of being a relative of his. It's about hearing his word and anyone can do that and obey it. So again, as we see the brilliance of Jesus, Jesus challenges, are you listening to my word? Yes, you can see my brilliance, but are you listening to my word? And are you putting that into practice? Well, what are we going to do with Jesus and his power that we read about in the Gospels? What are you going to do with Jesus and his teaching? How are we going to respond to the one who did so much good for his society and continues to do so much good? Sadly, then and now, some will call it evil. We'll call the church evil. We'll call his people evil. But Jesus points how illogical that is. How can Satan fight against Satan? Surely, do you see the goodness? It points to the fact that Jesus brings the finger of God. Jesus brings God's kingdom into our world. Which way are we going to go? Whoever is not with me is against me, said Jesus, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Another discussion question about which side we're going to be on with Jesus. But let's come and pray now that God would help us to understand the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. 
for sending Jesus into our world to fight against evil. We praise you that he is strong enough to defeat Satan, to drive out demons, to heal diseases, to do so much good in his lifetime. We thank you that he came into the world to destroy the devil's work. And we praise you for his teaching and the work of his spirit. So many lives down the centuries that have brought so much good into our world. We thank you that in the West, we've benefited so much from that. So we read the Gospels and the account of Jesus' life. Please give us a deep conviction that Jesus indeed is bringing in your kingdom, is bringing in the finger of God. And Father, as Jesus tells us, the way to be blessed is to listen to your word and to put it into practice. And Father, we pray as a church individually, Father, please help us to share the good news with those around us. Help us to speak with others and point them to the Lord Jesus and his goodness. And we pray that people in one said and further afield, we have to see that goodness, to see that defeat of evil. And we want to, to come inside the Jesus, to gather with him, to hear his word. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.